Welcome to Discovery Church. I think you ought to give yourself a hand because you have 100% attendance on Sundays right now. Come on, y'all. 100%. You know, you get the green sticker on the, remember that? No, the green. We don't do that here. I'm going to take attendance, but I'm glad that you are here at the begin, the very first Sunday of 2020 to kick off our first series that we're calling Better. God's plan is greater than my plan. And I, this is the same title as the book that I wrote, but the messages that we'll be bringing, it's a four-week series. They're going to be different than the book chapters. All different content is what I'll be bringing you. And here's the Here's the thought behind if I could set it up. I think a lot of us get to the end of a year and we probably look back and we feel like we left a lot on the table. Does anyone ever feel like that? Like, man, I left some on the table there. I could have, they say hindsight is 20, 20, no pun intended there, but, like, but hindsight is. It's, it's like, man, I, I wish I could have, or, or, or even for a lot of us, we get to the end of a year or sometimes the beginning of the year to look back and we think like, wait a second. I, I, I didn't do what I said I was going to do. I'm barely looking at my vision board and my goals again now. I'm like, man, I didn't do all these things that I did. And so today what I want to, uh, and in this series, and honestly kicking off this new year, I want to give you guys a challenge that this year would be different. And we have that opportunity, I think, every new year. is what, 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 It's a new opportunity. It's a fresh start. And today I want to I give you a challenge this, this new year to do something different, a different experience. You can get a different byproduct at the end of the year, you guys. Uh, I'm calling it like a 2020 challenge. And the challenge is before you set your goals and your plans and, and your vision boards and things like that, uh, what if we just got on God's plan for our life, that it, in every area of our life that is maybe out of alignment, that is, out of, uh, that, that is not living in, under God's will that we said, you know what, I'm just going to bring that into God's will and in his word. And if there are goals that I set, if there are things I go after, I'm going to make sure that those goals I'm setting line up with God's will for my life, both in his word and for my purpose. And if you did that, if every one of us were to take this opportunity, man, to to go after God with all of our heart, to go all in and to say, you know what, I'm going to stop doing my way, my plan, my agenda. I'm just going to throw that out and I'm going to figure out God's plan for my life. Then you would have the best year of your life. Dare I say it would be better. It would be so much better because God's plan, it is. It's better than our plan. Here's our theme verse, you guys. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9 says it like this, that we are confident that you were meant for what? You were meant for better things. You know that. Gosh, that, that, isn't that so amazing what God has for us? You weren't made for and meant for lesser things. You weren't meant for mundane living or mediocrity. You, you were meant for that. God has a plan for your life, and he says it's better. You were meant for better things, but these better things that God has for you, they're, they're so contrary to what we think. Because when we think of better, oftentimes there is a better that is offered to us, but sometimes the better that gets offered to us, it has a, has a promise, a high promise, but it comes with a heavy price. Have you ever took the, 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 the bait of the enemy? The Bible says the enemy's a schemer. He's crafty. And he'll bait us with, with his version of better. Hey, you could have a better marriage. It's not with the one you currently have, though. It's with this one. Okay. That's a bait. I'm telling, and we will fall, or a bait of hey, this, this, this will make it better. This car will make it better. This home will make it better. And th these, I'm telling you, these baits of better, these promises of better, the enemy, it comes with a heavy, heavy, heavy price. The price of your peace. The price, price of your joy. The price of your purpose, of your family, of your children that we're sacrificing on the altars of, of better. Oh, this is better. This is going to be better for me, and it comes with a price. God says, look. I have better things for you. I got better things for you, but they come contrary. They come with, he says, salvation. That the closer I get to God, the more accessible his better things are available and can flow into my life. That he does have better things, but it doesn't come the way you think it comes. It comes, he says, through salvation. And I think there, for a lot of us here, there's probably a point in time where, where, where you can probably even remember back of how you were close to God, like, man, I was so close to God, and you, you, were cl you felt his friendship, you felt his fellowship, you felt joy and peace, and you, and, and you, but, but now you maybe you feel like, gosh, how did, where did it go, where did, where did it all go, how did it, 
How did I lose what I once had? It's almost like, like the helium was out of the balloon. At one point in time, we were, we, but, but just, it, and now we're trying to blow it back up every year, maybe. Just, we blow it back up, and now it looks like it. It looks like the same balloon, but it don't float. It don't fly. It doesn't go. And a lot of us, we, we feel, I think a lot of us have, we felt like the air has been left out, the joy and the purpose and so many mistakes and just kind of the air is out of the balloon and you blew that thing up for, to make it look like, you know, you had air, but you don't float, but you're not rising. When nobody sees you, you're falling, you're down. How do we, how do we, how do we get back? So, so, so this message and this series is for anyone maybe that, that, that can remember that time. How do you get back? How do I come back home? How do I get the peace back? How do I get the purpose back? How do I get my joy back? How do I, or for those of you that, that never have had this before, how do, I, how do I come? How do I, I don't even know what the journey even looks like. Fortunately, there's a Bible story that I just want to dive into. I want to dive into one story and really just pull some truths out of it today that are really going to help us, no matter where you're at today, to come home. Come to, come, to come home. There's a story of that the in the bible it's called the prodigal son a lot of you have heard of the story of the prodigal son we're going to study it today and figure out that no matter wherever you're at in your life with god your journey of faith that really if we want the better things we need to come we need to come home you guys here let me in luke chapter 15 it tells the story of the prodigal son it's up here you got it in your notes in your handouts i encourage you to take some notes with me today jesus is telling them this story and he says a man had two sons the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate, estate now before you, you die. I want it now. Give me, give me what's due to me, God. I want, it, I want it now. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. You know, God will do that. God will just be like, oh, is that what you want? Okay. Is that okay? You want to make that? Okay. Go. Here you go. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. He got his... He got as far away from God, and that's who this father in this picture, in this, this story, it, it's, it's a picture, if you will, of God and his children. He got as far away from his father as he possibly could. And some of you are here today, I don't know how you found yourself maybe in church today, but, but you, you, for a while, were, were trying to get as far away from God as possible. You tried to put distance between you and God. Maybe you tried to get as far away from your purpose or from your calling or from God, from a relationship with God. You said, no, I'm just going to go do my own. I'm going to get as far away as possible. Some of you, it wasn't even intentional. You just ended another year and you looked up and said, how did I get here? How did the distance, this distance happen between where I was between, and where I am now? How did I get so far away. There's a few reasons, and I just want to point them out, how, we, how the distance happens, how we get so far away from God. Write them down. It's the same reason that maybe the, the prodigal son had, because here's what we say. We say, I know what makes me happy. I know what makes me happy. Give me, give me, give me. This is what's going to ha- make me happy. Give me mine. Give me mine now. And, and a lot of us, we're, we, we want, a lot of us have this goal. We have a goal of happiness. Oh, you know what I want for my new year for 2020? I always want to be happier. You cannot pursue happiness. You know that? If you pursue happiness, you will always end up empty. Happiness is not a pursuit. It is a byproduct. You cannot pursue. If that is that's a sure way to find and figure out, you will not be able to attain, grab hold of happiness if you pursue it because happiness is not something you pursue. It's a byproduct. A byproduct of what? It's a byproduct of your choices. You make some better choices in 2020, you're going to end up with some happiness. You're, you're going to make some different decisions this year, and you'll end up with some. It's not a goal. It's something like, oh, I want to be happy. No, you can't make that your goal. Make better choices your goal. But this is what we, oh, I know what makes me happy. I know what makes me happy. Or here's, here's another way we say it. I know what I want. Who are you to say, I know what my heart says. My heart, my, my heart tells me. This is, what, this is what's in my heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked, okay, above all things. I know what I want. It's not about what you want. What does God say? His plan is better. I'm just saying, let's get in alignment, you guys. I know what makes me happy. I know what I want. I'm just, if you live that way, you're going to end up with the distance again. You'll get to the end of another year, and there's going to be distance between where you could have been, where you know deep down you want to be, what you were meant to be, and there will be a distance. Here's, here, just, here, this is what the son knew, and this is what we say. We say, I know better. 
I know better than you, God. And maybe you've never said that, like you've never articulated that to God, but we believe it and we act on it. If, if many of us were honest, we would, we would admit, I'm not living God's plan for my life. I'm living my plan for my life because I know better. I know better. I mean, you may not, again, you may not say it, but we're acting like we know better by living our own plan. Let me continue the story because he moves off to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. It just, it was the, the effects, the, the byproduct of the choices of the distance of, of running. This is just the choices that we, the, the, what we've sown from it. About the time of it, that his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed some pigs and I can't even get into the the this is a Jewish story he's down to Jewish people and how the how unclean of a situation he was not only far away from God distance he was far away from God in his heart he was living so far away the choices he was making were so far away from what God what he knew God would want him to make the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him and that's where some of us get when we go our own way we, we're no longer like dreaming big anymore of like big picture, like dream and vision. And we're just, honestly, we're like, I just want to survive another day. Like that looks good to me. I'll take that. I'll just take that. And although God has these amazing, better things, the Bible says there are things that you can't even imagine. You can't even dream of. It's abundantly above all those things. And, and we, we're supposed to scale and dream up here with the better things. And because of the life that we're living, the choices that we're making, how far away from God, we start going, I'll just take this then. Give me the, give me the pods. Give me the pig, pig sty food. That's, that's, that's how low he was. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I know what I'll do. I will go home. I'll go home. Some of you need to do that today. To start off this, this better things, this better life, a different year, you need to come home. And he says, I know, I know. I'll go home to my father and say a speech. He typed it up, rehearsed it, and everything. Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a slave, as one of your hired servants. So he returned home to his father. So, so he, he cleaned his life up. He got his act together first. No. So he got a better job. So he, he got a promotion. So he got an education. So he, no, he made up his mind, and he Look, apparently God does not m mind how you come home. He just wants you to come home. He doesn't. Some of you are waiting like, oh, but let me fix this, and this ain't right, and this ain't right. As soon as he said, you know what, this doesn't make no sense. I know better. I know better than this. And can we just all agree that er like every one of us, when we came home to God, we, it was all for selfish reasons. Every one of us. Apparently, God doesn't mind. He doesn't mind why you come home. He just wants you to come home. He looked at his life, and this is the same thing for every one of us. Every one of us got to a point where we said, this sucks, that's better. That's that. And, and look, that, that's okay. That is okay because as you come, if something else changes you, you don't have it yet. You can't change yourself yet. It's inside out. So don't get all religious, high and mighty, and say, oh, but your motive's got to be. Forget all that. Just come home. Just come home, just as you are, just right where you are, and the transformation work will be based upon his work and his effort, not yours. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? So while he was a long way off, his father saw him coming, and filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him, and he said to his son, or the son said to his father, his rehearsed speech, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring and put it on his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf that we've been fattening. We've been getting him good and fat, man. We, we got to celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and he's now returned to life. He was lost and now he's found so now let the party begin. Isn't that a beautiful story? I love this story so much. It shows a picture of every one of us that has a tendency. Every one of us have a tendency to wander from our creator, to wander 
from our Father who just wants, who wants, who has so much better for us, to wander from our God who loves us so much. I want to point out just four things today, four things that if you want this year to be different, if you want the better things that God has available to you, I think we need to begin first Sunday of this year with four decisions that we have to make that the prodigal son showed us. Okay, take some notes, write it down. Number one, we got to start here. We got to get fed up with our life. I got to get fed up with my life. I got to get fed up with my circumstances. I got to get, I got to get fed up with the way things are. I just, I, there's got to come to a point where you get to this place and you say, I'm not going to live this way anymore. I can't keep up this pace. I am too stressed. I am too overworked. I am too lonely. I am too depressed. I don't even like myself. I may expect anyone else to like me. I don't even like me. Nothing is going to change until you get desperate. Until something inside of you says, I just cannot stand the way things are and the circumstances the way they are and get fed up with it. It's not going to change. Nothing gets better until you get dissatisfied. You got to get dissatisfied with the way things currently are. Hungry. Nothing will change until you get fed up. Look at the story, Luke 15. He moved to a distant land, got far away. And he wasted all his money. He began to starve. You just might want to put, he reached the bottom of the barrel. He reached the bottom of the barrel until he finally came to his senses. And that's where transformation starts, where something awakens inside of us. We come to our senses. Here, here's the question for you today. I want you to answer this yourself. Are you there yet? Are you fed up? Are you done? Is there need, do you need to... See more and experience more pain? Are, are, you, are you there yet? Because if you're not, that's okay. God will let you stay there. He's not going to rescue you there. He'll allow the rain to happen. Okay? And if that doesn't work, he'll allow a storm to come. He'll allow some pain and some trials. And well, why does God do that? Because God loves you so much just the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay there. God loves you. He loves you, you guys. And he'll cause some things because... He doesn't want you to waste your life. God loves you. The first step to better things is that you got to get discontent with the way you're living, with the what your circumstances, your choices, your life. You got to get discontent. This is what how Jeremiah, the prophet, how God says to the prophet Jeremiah, God says, "You'll find me when you finally get serious. When you quit, when you quit messing around, you quit playing around with your life." When you get serious about finding me and you want it more than that other thing you're chasing. When you want it more than that success or that promotion or that pleasure. Man, when you get serious though about finding me and you want it more than anything else, he says, I will show up in your life. You got to get fed up. See, God is not going to reveal himself until you get serious about your purpose. Until you get serious about, about, about him. You just gotta get, you gotta get this, that's step one. That's what needs to happen for anything to change, for anything to get better. You gotta get fed up with the status quo, same old, same old, just another year, more resolutions and goals that are gonna go by the wayside. Are you there yet? If you are, you can go to the second step. Number two, own up to my sin. I gotta own up. That's the second thing this young man did. First, he got fed up, then, He owned up. Look at verse 17 and 18. When he came to his senses, that's an aha moment, right? That was the wake-up call for him. We said, I know better than this. I know, like, this is nonsense. This is crazy. I can't maintain this lifestyle. I can't sustain this anymore. This is not fulfilling. This is not sustainable. Not only that, this is insane. He's saying, like, he, he came to his senses, meaning he was out of his mind. And that's what, you need to come to a place where you're like, this is crazy. Living without God is crazy. It's not logical. This sucks. That's better. What am I doing? What am I doing? It's an aha moment that we need to, every one of us get to. He comes to his senses and he says, I have sinned against God and you. Nothing is going to happen until you get to stage Two, where you got to own up. You just got to face up to the fact that you're living your life your way and not God's way. That you're living your own plan. You're writing your own goals and everything, and you're just and you're not living God's way. And and what are you owning up to? Own up to the sin. 
That's what we own up to. I mean, that's what it is. Let's call it out. That's what it is. We've got we to own up to it. Isaiah 59 says it like this, that your sins have actually caused the distance. That's what caused the distance. If you ever feel far away from God, you ever feel like your prayers are not there, you can't sense his presence, and, and if you ever felt that way, listen, who do you think moved? You think God went on a vacation? Is, God is ever present. God will love you unconditionally. See, a lot, of us, a lot of us, our minds are going to, when we get to that place of separation, that dry place, a lot of our minds go to what we're doing or not doing. And I don't want you to do that, please. We get to a dry place and we go, oh, I'm not reading enough. I'm not praying enough. I'm not doing enough. And that's not the reality. That's not really, maybe that stuff is happening, okay? But that's not really. The fact is, you started loving something more. You started loving something. Anytime that happens, separation will happen. In fact, anytime you love something more than you love God, and, he ta- and something else takes that place of God in your life, there is a word for that. It's called idol. That is idolatry. And people think that an idol is like a wooden statue or a metal statue you bound down to and you worship. That's not idol. Idols are anything that take the place of God. The, the, your, your affection and your love and your devotion and your time. You see, some of your idols may be your job. It could be that, that vehicle in your car, your hobby. It could be success or money or a relationship. Whatever it is that stole the place of God, it had a promise of better. It only separated. You became an idol in our life. we got to own up to those things because, God, there's a distance here now. That space in your life, that space in your heart that we're feeling with other things, it was, it was meant for something better. That space in your life was meant for something better, so I need to own up to my sins because here's a fact. You're as close to God as you choose to be. Oh, man, we end up, oh, man, why? Oh, how did he wander this far? What's the distance? Listen, you're as close to God as you choose to be. You cannot blame your parents anymore. Right. You cannot blame your wife or your husband. No, it's not their fault. You can't blame your kids. You can't blame your job. You can't blame your boss. You can't blame the government. It's just one thing you can't blame the government for, okay? You can't. You cannot. You are as close to God. Hey, at the end of 2020, if this happens again, you're at a distance. It's because you chose. You made some choices. And this is something we got to own up to, you guys, if we want to get closer to God and access these better things. You gotta, the reality is you weren't desperate enough for God. That's what it was. That's the reality, okay? And what do we, when we own up to it, when we say, oh, man, okay, I own up to my sins, what happens? Here's the fear. The fear for a lot of us is God's going to punish me. God's going to reject me. God's going to make me feel ashamed of myself because that's the way maybe your parents or your teachers or someone in your life taught you that. That is not the heart of God. Look what it says in Psalm 51. God, by the way, David wrote psalms, songs and prayers and, and hymns, and they were all experiences. When he wrote Psalm 51, it was right during the time where he committed adultery with Bathsheba and killed Uriah. He, he murdered her husband to get away with it, and he writes this psalm. This was the context. Context is important. Be merciful to me, O God, because of your constant love. It didn't change because of what I did. Because of your great mercy, wipe away my sins. Wash away all my evil and make me clean. And then he says something very powerful. You ought to underline it or something. I recognize my faults. I own up to what I did. I recognize it, God, and I'm conscious that I've sinned against you. And what happens when we own up? What happens when we recognize, if you can get to this place where not only you, you get fed up, but you start to own up, God is not gonna, he's not gonna make you feel ashamed of yourself. Isaiah tells us what God actually does. Because the Lord says, no matter how deep the stain of your sin is, I can hear the heart of David going, but God, I committed adultery. I I broke up a family, God. And God goes, no matter how deep the stain of your sin. But God, I killed a man. I had a man killed. I tried to cover up and lie. No matter how deep 
the stain of your sin. But God, you don't know how many people I've slept with. I've slept around a lot. I've done so much. I can't get that back. I've made no matter how deep the stain of your sin. You don't know how many people I hurt, how many people I've lied to. You don't know. No matter how deep the stain of your sin, God says, I can remove it. You don't have to live with that stain. You don't have to live with that shame. You don't have to live with the, with the pig pen mentality when God created you for the palace. Right. Amen, somebody? Yes. He says, I can remove it. I can make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. I can make you as pure as white. You say, I'll never get the better things now because let me settle for the pig pen lesser things. And God says, I've got better things for you. I've got better things. And they come with salvation. This verse right here is the oxyclean verse of the Bible. It's the tide stick verse of the Bible. You shout it out, man. So God will shout that stain out. Ain't nothing, nothing too deep for God. We got to get fed up. And you got you to gotta own up. Stop blaming everybody else for why you're not as close as you should be or could be. You got to recognize your own fault. Own up to it. You're as close to God as you choose to be. It can be different. It sure can. It can be better. Because when we do that, we get fed up and own up. Then here's what he did. Number three, we got to offer up ourselves. We got we to say, here I am, all of me, my total being, all of my mind, all of my strength, all of my soul, all of my heart, all of my gifts, all of my talent. I'm just going to offer up myself. We're doing this every year. We start the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. And if you're ready for this step stage, this is a good opportunity for you to step into something where you're distancing yourself by fasting, distancing yourself from things of the world and getting closer to God for an intentional time of 21 days. And maybe there's something you're really praying for, but here's what I would just encourage. Just pray for the voice. Just hear the voice of God in your marriage, in your life, in your future, in your purpose, in your, in your parenting. Just just pray and say, God, speak. Your servant is listening, and I'll bring my life into a yes, amen alignment to whatever you say, whatever you reveal. If you're ready for this third, when you get there, this will be a good step. 21 days. It starts today, this Sunday. And Monday through Friday, for three weeks, we'll be here in the church, 6.30 to 7.30 a.m. I'll be here for the morning, the morning portion of, of that devotion um, for the whole first week, I'll be bringing the devotion. I encourage you, if you're ready to offer up yourself, this is a good step. 21 days of prayer and fasting. But this is the third thing that this young man did. He got fed up. He, he, he went ahead and, and owned up. And then he started to offer up. Check it out. I love how he starts. Luke 15. He, he starts off saying, give me. Hey, give me, give me, give me, God. Give me, give me my share. And then he ends saying, make me. Oh, that's, that's where transformation happens right there. He says, gimme, gimme, gimme. And he comes back saying, make me. That's true transformation when you move from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. And here's the question again. Are you there yet? Or, or are you still at the, God, I need, I need, I need. Gimme, 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 God. Come on, God, I need a new, I need this, and I need that, God. And what, you, what can you do for me? Give me my stuff now. Listen, the better things that God has for you is not what he can give you. It's what he can make you. That's the, see, that's the better things, man. It has, it's not really what God is giving you. It's what he's making you. Because when you can change the posture of your expectation this year to and not give me, give me, give me to make me, you go from God, give me peace, give me peace, I need some peace, to God making you peaceful. God making you a peacemaker. Oh, God, I need your strength. I can't handle it to God making you strong. God, I need your anointing. God, I need your power to him making you powerful. God, I'm broke. I need some money to God making you richly blessed. Amen? If you want the better things of God, you need to go from God give me to God make me. Come on, man. You got to offer up everything. But let me tell you, this transformation doesn't happen overnight. I'm not giving you a quick fix here. I'm not giving you, hey, here we go in one week or in four weeks of this series. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a journey. You ever thought about the journey from, from the pig pen to the father? He was in a distant land. And he had to pick himself up and start the journey and start a process. And every step of the way and every day that went by that his stomach was hungry and he could go somewhere else. And, and, and he had to make a decision every moment and make the journey. Transformation is a journey. Second Corinthians chapter 3 talks about this journey. We, re we reflect on the Lord's glory and are uh, continuous being transformed. 
That we are being transformed into his likeness with, look at this, ever increasing. It's a scalable glory that God wants to every year by year, day by day, week by week, which comes from the Lord. That word transformation, you guys have heard me teach on this word metamorpho, comes from metamorphosis, that word transformation. It's, it's, it's a process. It's like the, the process that happens from a, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It, 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 you know, there's a cocoon, and then it crystallizes, and eventually after time, after the process, and there are some steps within that process that actually don't look good. They look quite ugly. Have you ever seen the crystallization of a cocoon? It's disgusting. It's like, ew, there's going to be some parts of your life in this transformation process that you go, gosh, this sucks. This doesn't feel good. This doesn't look good. I don't get what's, what's happening, but it is a process that God wants to take you on. And there's a starting point. The starting point of that process is going from God, give me to God, make me. God, change me. God, make I, I don't want. I don't want you to give anything to me anymore. I just want you to change me. Change me, God. Transform me. Make me what you want me to be. Inside out. Romans chapter 12 says it like this. Because of God's merciful to you, offer yourselves. That's what it's about. Offer yourself up. Give, give in. Give him your whole life as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is actually your spiritual act of worship. Start the process. Start the journey. And I love the, the father's response. Even from a distance, he says this. Continue to that next verse for uh, Luke chapter 15. Filled with love and compassion, he ran out to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And he said, bring out the best. Do you know God has the best for you in mind? Bring the best robe. Bring the best ring. Bring the best shoes. Bring the best calf. Man, it's time to party. Bring out the best. The moment you say, see, God isn't waiting for a moment for you to come knock down the door, beat down the door. No, God is waiting. Please listen. God is waiting for this moment where you make up your mind. The moment where you come to your senses and you go from, give me, you say, God, change me. And at that moment, well, he was still off at a distance. The father, look, if you make up your mind today and you say, God, change me, I want your plan. He will more than go halfway to you. He will more than meet you halfway. It'll be more than that. He'll run out to meet you right where you are. But you got to get to this place where you know you are made for more in this life. So how do we come back? How do we get home? How do, we, how do we access the better things that God has for us? Get fed up, all right? Stop, that the way that things are, the circumstances that they are, get fed up with it. You got to get discontent with it. And then you got to own up. You got to realize I can't blame anybody. I'm as close to God as I choose to be. You own up. Then you offer up yourself. And then there's a, one more thing that I do because now that I've, I've come and I've said, God, no, don't give me, make me. I'm enwrapped in God's love. I have forgiveness. I have his grace. I have his mercy. And I come home now, not to condemnation, but I come home to a celebration. So here's the last step, and it's an important one. Now I lift up my praise. Now I lift up my voice and I say, God, thank you for your grace. God, thank you for your goodness. God, thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness and your life. Thank you, God. See, praise ushers in God's presence. It changes the atmosphere. It changes our hearts. We do, we're bringing it back. We haven't done it in the holidays for two months, but we have a night of worship happening again at, at January 22nd, Wednesday night, a night of worship. And it's just not a night for you to enjoy good music. It is for your transformation. It would do you well to offer up a praise to God, but can I contextualize your praise for just a moment to what we're talking about today? Because you cannot praise away the process. <laughs> I know some of you don't want to hear that, but check it out. You cannot praise away the process. Some of you guys want a miracle in a moment. You want a quick fix, a quick recipe, a get it done real quickly. And there is a process of transformation that God, some, you cannot short work the journey, shortcut the journey that God has for you. Some things are going to take time in your life. Some things are going to take some effort. Some, some things are going to take more than a moment. Because it's going, to take, it's going to take some self-assessment, some self-actualization. Some things take repentance. Some things take conflict resolution. Some things take something else in our life, like, like new habits and changed behavior. It's not going to shortcut the journey. But here's what I want. I want to invite you on a journey. 
not, not a quick fix, nothing's going to, but, but, a, but a journey of, and check it out, a, a journey of not just a better year, but a better life. That's the journey. Not just a better week and a better month, a better outcome. <laughs> there, is, there are better things, a better life, a journey that God wants to take you on. In the programming of our entire year, every series, we actually start praying and fasting and looking and early in, in that last year of the series, they're all written out. At least, you know, a lot of the topics and studies. And the journey is so intentional for your development. Some things, it always changes. God will speak to me and something's changed. So don't, but the journey's there. There's programming. There's things that all of it is part of the process. And if you say yes to God and say yes to the journey, there's not just better things available to you. I believe there's a better life. You get fed up. Own up, offer up, lift up, and praise your way through. Look at Luke 15. It says, we must celebrate with a feast, for the son of mine was dead and has now been returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So let the party begin. See, life becomes a party when you get access to the better things that God has for you. One last scripture, Psalm 63. Because your love is it's better than anything this life has to offer Anything I can get from this life, God, your love is better than life. And because of that, I will glorify you. See, the Bible, the Bible doesn't say you have to sound pretty while you sing. It just says make a joyful noise. Okay? Something supernatural happens when you praise. and you praise God, the Bible says it, it unleashes his power, his presence, his, his provision, his protection. And I'm not sure where you're at on this journey back home today. You may be at a point where, where you said, I know better, God. Give me, give me what's due me. I know better. I'm going to do my own plan. I'm going to live my way. I'm going to make my choices. You may be right there, and maybe you're already experiencing some of the trauma that comes with that, some of the difficulties that come with doing your, your way, whether it's through your relationships, your career, whatever. It's going to happen because it doesn't work. It doesn't. Maybe you're there, though. Some of you are at a place where you're thinking, you know what? I know better than this. I know better. This sucks and that's better. I know better. And you're, you're, today you're coming to your senses and, and, and making up your mind. And you don't need to clean yourself up and come. You just decide. But some of you are even at a place where you're like, I don't know better. Um, I don't know better. Man, I know there's better. So you're either, I know better, I know better, or I, or I know better. Depending on the context and the inflection, that's where you're at. But I'd love to pray for you to begin this year. That this year could not be the beginning of just a year, but the beginning of a, of a decade, of a transformation, the beginning of a new life. It, it could just be the, a new beginning for you. It can be today. I'd love to pray for you, no matter where you're at, whether it's like you need to come back home or come home for the very first time today you can make that decision and no matter the stain, no matter how deep God can wash it out and he can give you better things. Can I pray for you church? Go ahead and bow your heads all across this room. I want to pray for you right where you are.